Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the Adults in 101 series. We're just going to wait a couple minutes um, and let everyone else join. So just sit tight for a few here. Some more. Hi, if you just logged on, we're just waiting a couple minutes just uh, to allow people time to log on. So just sit tight for a few and then we'll get right into introductions and thanks for joining us today. And if you have any questions um, before the presentation starts, you can feel free to put them in the chat and use that during the presentation as well. So I'm just going to start and give you all a little bit of a background on our programming here. So this is brought to you by the Senior Strong, which is out of the Development and Alumni Engagement Office. And as part of Senior Strong, we started the Adulting 101 series back during um, 2020, and we've continued it on to now. So two weeks ago, we had a career readiness webinar, and now we're having our real world readiness webinar. Um, and during this, we're going to have two of our alumni here, John and Craig, talk to you about um, different life tips, such as selecting retirement funds, health insurances, other benefits, um, discounts that your employments offer, how to take, how to, and how to truly take advantage of all the benefits that you have. So I'm going to first introduce John, uh, one of our alum here. So John, if you want to take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, it's nice to meet you. My name is John Buckley. I uh, graduated uh, Trenton State College. That was named back then. It was the year before they changed the name to TCNG in uh, 1995. Um, I graduated um, business administration with a concentration in finance. Um, and I currently work at a, one of the many large financial institutions out there, a company called TIAA. And our company focuses on working um, primarily with our customers in the not-for-profit market. So actually, Trenton State College of New Jersey, New Jersey Benefit Plan is actually one of our customers. Um, and I specifically work with um, employers like uh, the College of New Jersey to actually help them um, structure and help their employees understand the retirement benefits that they offer. So looking forward to speaking with you today. Awesome. Thanks, John. And our other alumni here we have is Craig, and he attended it as the College of New Jersey. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's nice to be with you today. I'm Craig Gross. I uh, graduated TCNJ in 2005 with a degree in history. Uh, similar to John, I've worked for a large financial services institution. He and I actually have uh, relatively similar jobs. Well, he works primarily with plan sponsors. Um, I work with individual investors. So I lead advisory services for individual investors at T. Rowe Price. And uh, excited to talk with you today about financial wellness and making smart decisions when it comes to your money as you guys graduate, enter the workforce, and... Uh, face lots of trade-offs and exciting decisions ahead. Thank you both. Um, great intros. And we are really excited to learn. I'm also very excited to learn. It's always good to hear different things about uh, finances and you're never too young or too old to start. So um, if either one of you want to jump right into our fun topics. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a nice job setting up basic outline of some of the key topics we want to cover and certainly if there's other financial related topics that the group's interested in um, do chat and we'll, we'll try to take the conversation there. Uh, I thought maybe John it's okay I'd start with one uh, two foundational concepts that we'll probably continue to touch on. Um, 
this won't be a finance lecture, so we're not going to go deep into kind of academia and theory, but, you know, we will kind of probably refer often to rate of return and time value of money as concepts that are going to apply across a lot of the decisions you'll make. And, you know, just in, if you're not uh, a finance major or you didn't study business, you know, generally a lot of the decisions you'll make in your personal finance have some rate of return associated with them. So if you're investing, you'll be rewarded for taking risk in those investments and that'll have a rate of return. If you're borrowing, if you've got a loan or credit cards or student loans, et cetera, then you're giving that rate of return to the lender and they're rewarded for giving you the money and taking the risk on your finances, right? So a lot of, I think what we'll center on is the concept of time value of money, rate of return. And generally you ought to be mindful of those concepts because you wanna maximize you know, the return of your overall household finances and minimize high interest in your, in your debt. The other concept I think we'll continue to touch on is a, a reality all of us will face, which is income is finite. And so that forces us to make smart trade-offs with our budget, with our finances, with our investing. Um, and so, you know, that'll play you know, be another theme that, that repeats as we step through kind of almost a investing for retirement 101, how to think about um, healthcare options your employer might offer you and then other benefits and how they can help you along the way. Yeah, and I'll, I'll up on that a little bit. I mean, trade-offs, right? That's really what this is all about. And your entire life, whether you're dealing with financial decisions, emotional decisions, everything's all about, you know, a little bit of a pro, a little bit of a con, understanding what you're giving up and what you're getting back. Um, the fact that you're on this webinar actually tells me that you're already a leg up on some of your peers because you're, you're starting to think about these things and learn about them. I will tell you this, um, we're going to, depending on how long we're here, a lot of this stuff gets really complicated quick. Um, so the best advice I would give you is, because um, you're starting here, or hopefully you have some foundational knowledge coming into this, but make sure you find people that you can always talk with and check, right? Whether it's peers, um, as you go into the workforce, there are informal and formal mentors, people that have been around the block, um, people that are passionate about helping others make good decisions. Um, and I urge you, as we talk about all these different healthcare, retirement, decisions, stuff like this, you're not going to remember it all. But just know that um, there's always help out there. Um, and you'd be surprised, depending on what kind of company you work for. But if you work for a large company, um, and Craig and I talked a little bit about this, because we're both at th these large financial services companies, and there is so much available to help us as employees make decisions. And so when you get into the workforce, there's gonna be so much help that's available to you. But one thing companies are really bad at is communicating that that stuff's available, right? They spend a lot of money, but the ability to like really educate, and like, hey, do you know this stuff's available? Is, is almost, that could be an art. And there's plenty of people that know how to know what's available and you to find them, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that, but trade-offs and having people you can speak to um, to you know, learn about what the best practices are will be successful for the rest of your life. You know, if you just follow those. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just even taking the step as John mentioned, is showing up today indicates uh, uh, um, interest and fearlessness around kind of taking first steps uh, towards financial wellness. And so those are um, encouraging signs for you. Give yourself a pat on the back. One of the biggest challenges we see with uh, investors in general is uh, concepts of inertia, which is uh, I'm going to continue to not do something or make better decisions because I'm ignoring the complexity of it and maybe the discomfort with making a change. Um, and so, you know, you're taking some good first steps to overcome inertia uh, and making good financial decisions. So kudos to you. Um, maybe we start with concept of investing for retirement. Um, you know, what I'll maybe start off with is at a very high level, you know, this might be a familiar concept to everyone, but at a very high level, you know, generally when you think about investing for retirement, um, you, what you'd be faced with is a selection of um, investment strategy options and very basic of it, it's going to be stock or equity investments and bond or fixed income investments. And, you know, this group might have general awareness of the two and the differences, but basically, 
you're buying a stock investment, you're taking partial ownership of that company, you're rewarded for taking the risk of that ownership stake, and you're rewarded through the earnings that that company earns over time, the value that they generate. If you're investing in bonds or fixed income, then you are essentially making a loan to a government or to a company. And the return on that, the interest on that loan is rewarding you for taking the risk that maybe they might not make good on, on, on that loan, right? And so both of those investments, um, you know, you'll be, you'll be deciding between. And one of the things you'll likely encounter as you start your employment is the opportunity to participate um, in an employer-sponsored plan, the 401k plan or 403b plan or some other uh, driven thereof. So, um, you know, maybe we could take a few minutes talking about structure of those plans, why you might want to start early, and then circle back to different types of investments and how you might think about making investment selections in that context. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so you're going to get your first job, and depending on where you work, one of the benefits is the retirement benefit, right, that they offer. And it probably is going to be one of two options. One, um, without you doing anything, they may just put some money into your into your savings, into your retirement account, right? It's pretty common in certain industries to just say, you know what, as a condition of employment, we're going to give you, say, 3% or some percentage of your salary every year um, to start you on the savings strategy. Typically, what they often if they don't offer that, they offer it as an option for you to take a step to do it. And sometimes what they do is say, if you put money in, we will match it. And so this idea of matching is very big in the 401k world. Like if you work for a for-profit company, especially in financial services, for example, um, usually the, the more prestigious an institution, a company, the bigger their retirement benefits in general, because it's an attractive benefit. Um, a smaller company might have a, a smaller um, contribution formula, if you will, to, to invest in that. But at the end of the day, if, it, if there's one thing you remember out of all of this, right? If a plan is offering you a match, which means if you save, they will match your savings, you want to take advantage of that because it is the single most efficient way for you to increase your money because it doubles it, right? If I put 3% in and they're giving me 3%, I've essentially doubled my money for my retirement savings, and it's the best deal you can get out there because all of this is pre-tax and it grows tax-free, and you only pay taxes on it when you retire way, way in the future. One really important way that helped me, uh, two things. One, when I joined the first company I worked, it was actually a smaller agency, um, but because it was small, she had to attract people, uh, the woman that owned the company. And so when I joined, I said, listen, I don't have any money. I'm not saving my retirement plan. That thing's so far off. I don't really have it. And there was a, a colleague who said, she's matching the money you put in up to everything you put in. So you have to do this to double your money. You're a fool not to. This is what this person said. And I'm like, I'm like I can't afford it. It's like, you find a way to afford as much as you can because you're doubling your money. You will never have an opportunity like that. The other thing he said to me, which is incredibly important, I think, because it's so hard to do the trade-off. I got to make my rent. I got to, you know, I'm just graduate. I'm finally making money. I, I've got so much. I have to pay maybe, maybe a student loan, credit card, whatever you're doing. How do you find a way to pay for this as an option? One thing it does is it's an asset that you have immediately, even though you're seeing the benefit in the future. So one thing he told me was when you go to buy your first home, you now have an asset which you can use to help you buy that home. In some cases, you take a, take a loan against it, not necessarily encouraging that, but at least you're taking a loan from yourself, maybe for the down payment. But it is something that you can benefit from, not just in retirement. And that what it allowed me to do is think about, this is something that is going to help me in the next 10 years. I eventually expected to get married, you know, perhaps buy a house. So that was like a way for me to think about something that's long-term in nature, but to free up that money now to take advantage of that benefit. And boy, Am I glad I did now, right? I just, I, my, I just turned 49 last week and my retirement savings is so much stronger because of those early years, because the long, earlier you invest, the more your money works for you over the long term. So, uh, you know, 
find a way to save. And if there's a match available, you really have to take advantage of, the, of that because that's honestly the thing that can really help you the most when it comes to financial planning when you're young. Yeah, that's a really good point, John. And, you know, you mentioned in there, it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you're first starting to prioritize even a few percentages of a few percentage points of your income going towards long-term savings. Um, but it kind of pays off. Um, you know, I think time value of money and that rate of return. And, you know, if you assume different organizations have different kind of assumptions about what long-term rates of return are, but if we just kind of assume that a relatively balanced investment strategy is going to get you somewhere around 6% return on average over time. You know, maybe consider this, right? Starting to invest a dollar you put into that investment 40 years before you retire will essentially be worth 10 times, right? $10 at retirement. If you wait until 20 years to retirement, it's three times. If you wait till 12 years to retirement, it's two times. So by waiting, you're giving up that massive growth opportunity. And what that means is when you find yourself 15, 20 years into your career thinking about, I'd like to have a comfortable retirement, you have to put in several times more of your pay to catch up, right? So starting early is definitely difficult. Um, but if you could find a way to kind of take that savings off the top, that growth opportunity you get from those additional years of having an investment um, will be uh, something, you know, to John's point, you, you open the account a little bit into your career and you say, I'm glad I listened to that guy. <laughs> it's right, it paid off. Um, uh, you know, the other thing, um, uh, you know, we'll talk about is I talked a little bit earlier about stock investments, bond investments, you know, we will also likely find in your employer sponsored plan, let's be kind of come the um, gold standard for what most investors will uh, at least start with are target date funds or retirement funds. And, you know, John and I aren't here to give you any specific advice or making a specific recommendation of how you should invest. But, you know, the extent you might get started with an employer sponsored plan, do spend some time learning a bit about that option. Um, what that option basically is, is it's a diversified package of stock and bond investments, professionally managed with a glide path. And what a glide path generally means is that the product is set with your eventual retirement date in mind. So it might be called retirement fund or target date fund, let's say 20, 60, yeah, right, 2060 or 2065, maybe even, right? And that strategy will start out with a lot of stock, more aggressive investments. And if you stay in it over time, you'll become gradually more conservative to match what is a responsible asset allocation, right? Mixed between stocks and bonds for you over time. Um, you know, John mentioned earlier an important point, which is this stuff can be overwhelming. If you're first stepping into kind of these financial decisions, just the information can be overwhelming. And a good piece of guidance I've received in the past is like, stay where it's familiar. Stay with the concepts that like you can digest and you understand. So one of the values of package solutions like a target data retirement fund is it almost has a degree of embedded advice in it and that it's tailored to kind of where you are in your path towards retirement. And so if you're not sure where to start and you might be overwhelmed with the selection and opportunities around investments, that's something to look into uh, because they're intentionally designed with your retirement goal in mind. And they take some of the complexity of trying to formulate a, a portfolio strategy, you know, out of the equation for you. Yeah. So the first thing, take advantage of the match, save as much, you know, the, the, you know, what Craig said is um, when you graduate, you start your job, um, your biggest asset that you have, right, is your time and potential. Right, because you haven't realized anything yet. You don't have the, the potential of the, you know, you haven't accrued that experience. You don't have that, that you have earnings potential and you have time on your side. So you want that to work for you. And that's where investing early, putting as, put as much as you can, you know, comfortably afford. And so the comfortably, what can you afford, right? Again, trade-offs. And so talk a little bit about like having a plan and a budget, right? And I know I, I, my daughter um, is actually going to college next year and she's, you know, she's been working for actually a couple of years now, but the whole concept of having a budget 
hopefully you have one now, right? I mean, there, you, you, hopefully you've, you've, this is something you're not brand new about, you know, you want to be able to spend less than you make. Um, it's very hard when you're in college, obviously, because you, you're there to learn. Your job is to learn and you're paying money to do so, or someone's paying money to do so, or you got a scholarship, the state's paying for it, somebody's paying for it. Um, so your ability to actually earn at this point is limited. But that your first few years coming out are really the place where you can get caught up the most. You're going to be earning the least amount for the most part, right? Um, and your expenses are going to be completely different one year from now than where they were now, depending on where you work. You know, I, I moved to Hoboken, which is right outside Manhattan. So I wasn't paying Manhattan prices. I had to live, live with roommates. Um, you may or may not need a car and the, and the expenses that go with that and insurance. And what you really need to start thinking, get a handle on is what you're going to make and how your, where expenses are. And if you have debt and the one credit card debt is one of the biggest killers, a lot of, you know, especially when you're in college, I remember, I remember being a freshman walking in, they had the table from Citibank and I signed up and I got my credit card. And fortunately I, I didn't come out of college with a huge amount of credit card debt, but when you think about like your priority of finances, you know, you want to take advantage of the match because it's free money. Um, you want to make sure you're paying down that high interest credit card debt. That is one of, that is a derailer. Um, you're not alone. If someone on this call is like, my goodness, I have so much, I don't know how to get a handle on it. There's so much help that you can get, especially on the employer side. Speak to people. Employers actually offer credit counseling. Um, make sure it's reputable. Um, through the employer, you know, de definitely talk to someone. You're not alone. I just want to say that. Like it's, I I've been there, right? You have this amount, you're feel you're a little ashamed of it possibly, but the ability to kind of manage that before it gets out of control, um, especially in those those first three, four, five years out of right out of college. And so, you know, I was I was thinking, I was talking, I tell my daughter, it's like, if you don't have a budget, you're driving down the car without a speedometer and headlights. You're just moving along. You have no idea what's coming or what's how to financially how to manage what's what what your situation is. So just like have the basics, understand what your essential expenses are, the things I know I can have. The perfect position is you start to save a little bit more, have like one month's or one paycheck extra so that you can absorb a, 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 an expense if it hits. Ultimately, you'd like to be able to have maybe six months. You want to build up this pr protection so that when that unexpected expense hits you, a car accident, uh, a ticket, um, we'll talk about healthcare, depending on what kind of healthcare you have. You can have a little medical event. There's so many things that just get in the way of you being and just no, ex anticipating them and building that into your budget um, is so critical. It's the number one, honestly, it's like take advantage of the match and have it just a budget, or just a sense of it. There's so many apps. I think, uh, Jules, you mentioned this, right? There's just so much online now, too, that didn't have when I had to use paper and a ledger, and I used to, like, keep that stuff. Um, but you can track all of these things. I highly recommend doing that so you can get a sense of financial control, and it'll give you confidence. Yeah. I think that's uh, really good guidance, John. And, you know, again, in the context of rate of return, the match that we've been talking about um, – for all intents and purposes, it's almost like an immediate 100% return, or some employers will say we'll match 50% of, but like it's immediate to your point, like almost free money. It's a part of your, your kind of compensation in a way, right? Um, and then credit card debt is probably the second biggest one. And, you know, as John said, no shame in it. Just do what you can to try to pay it down as soon as possible, because it's probably a 20% negative rate of return for you. Uh, and that's going to probably be the second biggest, uh, you know, the second biggest uh, rate that you're going to see in your personal finances, right? Um, the benefit of the match versus then the next thing is the, the challenge that that negative rate of return uh, creates for you. Um, and then everything else thereafter is probably optimization, do the best you can. But I think also really good input in there, John, is, hey, as soon as you're able, start to try to build a bit of an emergency fund. And that might seem overwhelming. Gee, they're telling me I got to hit this match, which is a few percentage points of my salary, and then I got to try to find a way to have that emergency fund. Um, um, so, you know, we're not, we're not suggesting it's an easy process, but you know, putting the, the money aside and, and being disciplined about that 
will save you from a lot of heartache later. Um, the other way you'll thank yourself is by kind of managing the debt load and, you know, building a little bit of that safety cushion early. You kind of insulate yourself when down the road you really want the, the credit worthiness, right? So maintaining a good credit score and maintaining kind of healthy budgeting and credit habits will help you when you look to buy a house uh, or if you want to start a family or those other larger expenses that are going to start to, to cause you to maybe seek uh, um, uh, loans or credit in other ways. Uh, so healthy habits now will help you when, when you're looking for, you know, for things that will come in the future. Definitely. And something to important to keep in mind for the budgeting, I believe John mentioned it is budget for your, um, your health insurance as well, because that does come out of your paycheck most times. I know um, being in New Jersey, you're able to stay on a parent's plan until you're 26, and that stays until the end of the year. So this year I turned 26 in August, so I get kicked off my parent's plan, but at the end of the year. So I'm able to stay on until December, but luckily I work here at TCNJ and we have a great plan, um, but there are so many plan options. And as John and Craig have said, it's more just being aware of all the options that you have out there and talking to people and seeing where they're at and what they've enrolled in. And John and Craig, um, they've been, they've had to deal with this in the past. And it's something that we all, you know, living here, we have to deal with registering and enrolling in your health insurance. And it is, it is very confusing for a new person to come in. So just use what they say um, with finding a mentor and find someone, just ask as many questions as you can because just knowing that the resource is there is the first step and then taking that action and being proactive and asking questions about it is the second most important thing for it. Yeah, I think it's a good segue. Let's maybe turn there for a few minutes and talk about um, health insurance and some of the things you might hear about as you're, as you're enrolling there. Um, and then I think John teed up towards the beginning of the conversation, just the wealth of other benefits that you might have through your employer that you ought to look into because they could be really valuable to you. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll do, do, there's two types of, there's generally two types of healthcare um, plan approaches, right? Um, depending on where you work, um, you know, you have to kind of what's available and also what the options are. So. I can't, we can't cover all of them here, but the, I'll tell you about the two kinds, right? One is just your traditional healthcare benefit where um, the employer pays a good amount, you pay a good amount, um, and you have to manage the benefit, right? There's generally, um, there's in-network and out-of-network. Um, you generally will probably have good coverage, especially for when you're young, right? Um, and, uh, maybe, and actually, it may be more than you need right? Because if you're relatively healthy, especially when you're young, um, you're actually paying for a level of coverage in that case um, that, that you may or may not have an option to be in, right? That provides certain, certain care for you, right? Um, doctor visits and if you, you know, whatever happens, you can, you know, all the different medical places, you can go to a hospital, emergency care and all that. Um, there's a lot of um, the, the, the new, uh, what are those things that are popping up now? Uh, the medical Urgent care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The emergency care centers and stuff—they're generally less expensive. Um, but a lot of the reason that's popping up is because of this other version now, and they're called high deductible plans. And essentially, what they what they do is it's actually mathematically, I don't think it's much different. I know at my company we offer both. You could have a rich benefit plan in which you pay a lot of money, or you can be in a high deductible plan where you're essentially paying less money. But if something happens, you have to pay for it up to the deductible. So just like a car, and if you're familiar with insurance, uh, there's a deductible. If you get a little fender bender, if it's $200, guess what you're paying for that? If it's $1,000, you're paying the $200 and they're paying the other eight. Well, it's the same thing in healthcare, these high deductible plans. And they may be attractive when you're younger, when you don't have a lot of events. Having said that, if you have something... Uh, boy, I remember I got a horrible case of poison ivy. And I just, you know, I went to the emergency room when I was, I think, like 26 years old. Well, nowadays, if I went and did that in a high deductible plan, I'm probably getting like a fifteen, two thousand dollar bill for it because now you're paying as you go, and you're seeing the the cost. And medical and medical is insane how expensive it is. 
So on the when it's all covered, you're not seeing it. When you're high deductible, you're seeing it and paying for it, um, but you're covered. So it's it's really a choice. Your health, your specific health, should really factor into it. It's it really is an insurance. You know, it's the typical insurance like the, the trade off, right? Am I paying for someone to absorb this risk, or can I afford to absorb it myself? And so those two, and there's a, I won't get in, maybe Craig, you could expand on that. Maybe talk about the HSA, which goes along with a high deductible to the extent that's an option. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I think that is it, right? I think the, the, the key here is that as you're presented by what your employer offers in the health insurance, do some back to the envelope math and it won't end up being overly complicated, right? What they'll present you with is a premium. It's the amount they're going to take out of every paycheck, multiply that by the number of paychecks. And then what's the total out-of-pocket expense for those deductibles, right? And that gives you a better bit of a sense of what's the total amount you might be in it for. And it can be helpful for two reasons. First, it can be helpful to compare the different plans and the trade-offs, as John mentioned, of either a higher premium for a more traditional plan, but lower probably out-of-pocket deductible, right? Versus the opposite of a lower premium, but you have to have some emergency savings because the deductible is going to be high. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of one. Uh, so, so do the homework, do the math there and pick the one that you think is going to be comfortable for you, which might be partially a decision around how much are you going to be able to sock away in emergency savings in case you get poison ivy like John did. <laughs> my brother, by the way, had po- terrible poison ivy at my wedding. He's my best man that he had. <laughs> gotten poison ivy and somehow got it from his hands onto his face. So his eyes were almost swollen shut at my wedding. And I think he had to pay a large deductible for that one too, John. So you're in good company here. Um, Anyway, uh, tangent. So uh, John mentioned the concept of the HSA, right? The other thing you're going to likely encounter along with what plan do you choose are concepts of a FSA or HSA. Um, and so we'll quickly kind of describe what those are. What an FSA basically is, is that you're deferring some of your income that you'll later apply that same year towards your health expenses. And the benefit is it's pre-tax, right? The drawback of an FSA is if you don't use it, you lose it. So you have to use it in that year. Sometimes there's a bit of a grace period, but generally speaking, what you're putting aside for it, you then have to use. Um, HSA is a newer concept. It's a health savings account. And as John mentioned, HSA is really only available with a high deductible health plan. So the FSA is really would be available with both options. The HSA is unique to being paired with a high deductible plan. And what's neat about the HSA is that it has a triple tax benefit. So you put the money aside with pre-tax dollars, it grows tax deferred. And if you use it later in life, for qualified medical expenses, you can actually take that money out without tax. So there's that triple tax benefit. Unlike the FSA, what's nice about the HSA is that it's your asset. It's portable. You can take it from one employer to another. You can invest it in investable assets. So you can actually see growth of that as a long-term investment to supplement your retirement. So it's best looked at almost as the equivalent of a retirement savings plan or an IRA, though the money is still available to you in that current period. So if you end up putting it aside and you need it later this year because you have you know, an unexpected healthcare expense, you could, you could extract it in that same year. But you can view that over time as another way to save deliberately for retirement with tax benefits you really won't find across other account types. So this is kind of a new... Uh, a new, uh, new is relative, right? A relatively new, it's just taking hold. People are still using it more like the FSA, but if you're able to over time leverage this account, it can actually generate a lot of value for you in the long term as, a, as an additive way of, of saving for your retirement. Um, you know, but that gets me to an important point, which is something that I think John alluded to towards the beginning of the conversation, which is part of this is, we also have to be realistic. There's a lot of things in our field, you know, John and I is, you know, working in the financial advice space. There's a lot of things that, you know, academically we know can help optimize. You're not gonna be able to do it all on day one. So part of this is being pragmatic, right? Do the things that are gonna generate the most value for you, 
be aware of other options out there for you. Continue to aspire to take additional steps towards financial wellness, but it's okay if you can't do it all at once. If you've got a decent budget, if you're being smart about debt and doing the best you can with managing down debt and avoiding debt, and if you're starting to save as early as possible through wise diversified investments for retirement, you should be proud of that progress. Over time then, be hungry for how else can I optimize? What else can I do, right? So as we mentioned some of these concepts, don't feel like you gotta nail it all on day one. And, and be cautious that the more you study some of this, the more you could potentially get overwhelmed and just walk away from it. Try to avoid that. Try to stick with it, be pragmatic, pick the top things that you think you can manage and get started. Yeah, my, I think of uh, my wife, right? So my wife is a couponer, right? She is fixated on getting the best deal possible every shopping experience she ever goes on. Me, I am not. However, when I go to Hobby Lobby, you're kind of a fool to pay retail there because you can absolutely just go online and just download a 20% coupon when you go in there. What's so, the hobby? I don't know. It's like a hobby shop. They have like crafts. Like, stuff. Like, no, no, but what's your hobby? What do you go oh, about? Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I refurbish some furniture and sometimes I'll buy that. Oh, cool. So, so, but um, anyway, I bring that up because depending on where you are, if you're like this person that is like really looking to optimize, we're talking about a lot of these things you can do it. And there's, again, you're not going to memorize everything or on this call, but there's just so many ways to game this, work the system for your benefit. There's tax advantages, loopholes. You hear about the wealthy and how they take advantage of it. Well, that's all they're doing. They're taking, looking at the system and making their money work as smart and as hard as they possibly can. There's people that know how to do it. And frankly, there's a ton of ways you can learn how to do it too. Online. I mean, all these things are, in, I'm sure you can go on TikTok and there's probably channels that devoted to this stuff. So there's an app, there's tons of ways to do what we're talking about here. But if not, we're also talking about the basic stuff you got to do, right? The match, having a budget, you know, just having a sense of where the where those are going, you know, um, where your money's being spent, paying down the debt. Like if you're not doing those things, you're then going to be in, you know, the, the, you're the person that's always paying the debt. You're not, you know, you're, you're never looking to get a better deal or your money do anything better for you because you're just not taking the time to invest in your own value of your money, right? And if you value your money, there's just some things you have to do, which we're touching upon here. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we keep saying, because I think we remember how hard it was for us and we both work in an industry where our biggest challenge is getting people to care and focus on this. So... It's, it's, and it's such a difference, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm preaching a little because if we're passionate about it, I mean, I, my daughter's entering this world and I just, we're trying to keep, have, teach healthy behaviors to her. But um, there's just, the last thing I'll just say, you know, on the thing is on your work benefits, there's so much available. At TIA, they give me $15 towards my Verizon bill, right? If I go around and walk around the hall and ask people, I bet you half the people don't even know about it. Right. It's just a perk that as a company we have. Um, if you want to adopt a child, we have adoption services. And actually our company will help pay for the process as an ancillary benefit. I don't know where it falls under the benefits we offer. It's just, there's just so many things that employers, they, what, why? They need two things from you. They want you to stay there. Because for the most, because, because it's cheaper to keep you there than to rehire and replace you. So they want to retain you and they want you to value what the, the relationship with you. And they're spending money in all these creative ways to do it. That's really why, because you're a valuable employee to them, because you're providing value to them. They're paying you. And to the extent they can do more outside of the salary, especially in certain industries where it's not even about salary, it's about the robust benefits. So make sure you find the people in your where your first job that know how to work the benefit system with that you that are available to you, and you'd be yep. you get tickets. You can go to someone's. Time, you go. We get free like discount Broadway tickets like through the company, you know. So that is that is it's it, to your point, John. Like it's not going to be posted all over the office that you work in, but there's actually probably pretty rich benefit savings that if you take advantage of it, it's probably will amount to hundreds right? 
if not more in, in potential savings over the course of the year. You know, I took a look uh, similarly today between fitness, financial wellness, mindfulness. Um, you know, these are common things, partially because your employer also wants you to be well. They want you to be, you know, physically, emotionally, and and financially well, right? Um, and so, just uh, take the time to do the research on that. I think is 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 good guidance from John to because you'll be surprised with what you find and what you might save um, through that. Uh, yeah, and just quickly on that with the employee benefits, um, a lot of employers work with. Um, a lot of employers, they work with different companies that'll have discount codes for places such as Under Armour, Nike, they have different codes on there and you can log right in. And just like John was saying at Hobby Lobby, you can just download a code and it's right there. I worked benefits previously at my last job and so many people just weren't aware of different options that you can enroll in, even if you're not part of the health benefits. So I was part of um, different benefits, even though I didn't have the medical benefits through my company, I was able to still get a fitness month and all of that stuff. So it is really a lot um, to on yourself to look into, but just being aware that those benefits are out there is really helpful because everyone likes yeah. to save money. <laughs> Absolutely. Are there any the other? Questions? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the last thought I'll offer, um, and again, I hope. I hope John and I, and some of this you viewed as, as uh, thoughtful guidance, and I hope it doesn't come across for preaching at you. We're, ex we're, we're excited for you as you enter the workforce and you start this new chapter. And so, you know, if you can kind of learn from our mistakes and also some of the sage wisdom we've received, that's, that's the intent here. I'll offer one last thought to you, which is something that, you know, um, uh, I think there's been a trend away from seeing a first employer is a place where you can build a career. So something to just be mindful of is as early as you can, begin to think more about career versus job. And I know, especially with all the great opportunity out there and creative ways of kind of earning income available today, that it might be compelling to think about first couple of years out of school as, hey, I got a job, I got a gig, I got a few of those. It's working for me. But one of the things I know I've benefited immensely for is working for companies that, that want me to make a career there and will invest in me and where I can actually see long term. Um, the first couple of years are challenging, right? Your income will be limited. The demands on how to use that will be significant. And it might be appealing to try something different that might give you a little bit extra income. But consider what does that look like in the long term? Do you see yourself going down that path in five years? Will it be lucrative 10, 15, 20 years down the road? And so just be mindful as you make those decisions that there's benefit in, in, in building a career somewhere. And strong employers are going to want to invest in you and invest in that career. Because uh, to John's point, they want you there for the long term. It's not good to have turn and have people come and go. They want people who you know, are going to grow up in the organization and, and take on bigger, better things over time. Um, I know that's another piece that like might sound like, okay, great, but that's a little bit difficult these days. Um, so take it for what it is. Think long-term as you make these decisions is, is, is the general guidance. Jules, did you want to open it up for questions? Yeah, I think um, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, either chat them in or come off of mute, um, ask them yourself. I know I've definitely learned a lot. Like I said, I graduated in uh, 2018, so I am new to all of this as well. So I know that it's really, it's really challenging and scary coming into the workforce and everything, but just remember that you have all these resources and especially remember that you can always reach out to TCNJ alumni like John and Craig who are here to help you. We're all, we're all here to support you in all of that. Um, so if anyone has any questions on any, any of the topics that we covered, I know it was a lot with um, all the finances and then um, different things about all the benefits, but I hope that you all have learned some, some good information through it. Um, let me see if I'm seeing any come through. Hi, everyone. I do have a question. First of all, I want to thank John and Craig. This was very, very helpful. I was like sitting and taking notes. So thank you. 
Um, you said something about package solutions and it, like I wrote down, like it takes away the complexity of formulating this portfolio strategy myself. Can you provide like uh, a name or where I could look into more, like more information on that? Sure. I, so I think the, the one he mentioned is the, the is a, it's called a, a life cycle fund or a target date fund. Typically that's the name. So when you, when you work, sign up for your retirement plan, you're going to get, if you actually choose nothing, they usually just put you automatically. Put you into it, yeah. Or if you, you can choose which one's right for you. Um, and what, as, as Craig kind of mentions, it's packaged in that it's not, it's got some sort of intelligence going on in that it's looking at your age. It's actually saying, boy, you're this age, given what we know that your age is, and you may retire, you know, when you're 67 or 65 or something like that, you probably should be invested this way. Um, so only looking at your age, it's a solution, right? It's not just a, a product, but a package solution. It's actually taking a bunch of investments and managing them for you over time. And then there's variations on that theme, you know, endlessly in financial services about how you can add more value and get more creative. Um, but one thing I, I didn't actually mention too is a lot of times, like my company works with employers, we offer free to every employee access to advice. Somebody that's job is to look out for you from a financial perspective. They're not compensated to sell you products or something. They're actually brought in by the employer. They have a resp fiduciary responsibility to put your interests first because it's coming through the retirement plan in particular. And so there's there's access to people that are experts like, like us, even better than me, certainly, but more like Craig, this is Craig's world really, um, that can, they can help you make the right financial decisions and put a plan in place. Like, so that whether it's having a budget starting now or when you go to meet different challenges, buying a house, paying for college education, all of those things. Yeah. The, the solutions can be personalized or packaged. Yeah. And there's a range of uh, asset management companies that offer target date funds, retirement date funds, and other life cycle uh, products. So if you Google any of those, uh, it depends on who's doing the best with their advertising campaign, or their search dollars, but, um, you'll find a couple quality asset managers out there that provide these solutions. Probably what you'll find, that, well, what you will find in your employer plan is that they've aligned with an asset management firm that provides those investments. And so um, it's typical that your employer sponsored plans fund lineup is gonna include these strategies and it'll be just the first name, and it'll be whatever fund company they happen to be, to be working with. Um, but if you Google target day fund, you'll, you'll find, uh, some good information there. Okay. We'll do. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. That was a great question. Um, if anyone else has any, feel free to, uh, and we have one through the chat here, so I will read it. We have, thank you, Craig and John for all this information. Are there any recommendations for websites, apps, resources for budgeting? Um. You know, I should have anticipated that one, John. I don't know if you got anything <laughs> on budgeting. Um. You know, there's there's really there's just a lot of them out there. Um, a lot of them are integrated into the banking sites too. You know, I, that's a good place to go um, to get. Yeah. You know, like I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, every bank if you keep if you have a bank account is going to have some sites there. Any one of the financial services sites have tools and calculators. We have them. I know T Row has them. Everybody does. Uh, I'm trying to think of an app that's that's Mint is one. I haven't, so I'm not necessarily advocating for their product, but Mint is one. I think it's powered by Intuit. Um, there's Another. a range of them out there, and you might see that you might see that as you get to the workforce those types of financial wellness solutions are also uh, offered through your employer, potentially through the provider of that employer sponsor plan. Um, increasingly, uh, um, 401k um, providers are bundling 
their record keeping services with financial wellness capabilities. Yeah, I, I mean, you know what? I, what I would do, and I could go to Google and put in top budget apps, and you yeah. know that there's plenty of people that are rating them in the pros and the cons. Oh. You know, um, I would probably say don't pay. I would lean towards yeah. probably shouldn't be paying because it's 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 pretty simple. Um, oh, you know, one other thing too um, that is really helpful. My daughter actually pointed this out to me. Um, you know, all her expenses are categorized. You know, she doesn't actually have, I, we, she doesn't have a credit card, but she has a debit card um, through her bank. And she uses that as a credit card at, at this point. Um, but she, every month, you know, when she gets her state, you know, online statement, you can see how things are categorized. So that's, I mean, that helps, right? It, it, she gets to see, wow, I'm spending a lot on food and, and clothing versus, you know, where can I cut back? Um, versus, you know, I have her set up to meet some savings goals because she's, because she's working, which is a good healthy behavior. So, um, but I, you know, I would just, if you're really looking for, if you're, again, you're someone that wants to really get into it and track it, I'd go online and find out what people like you are at your age in particular, how they're, what ones they're using. Yeah. I got competitive, right? Yeah. I got another one that, again, I, I can't speak for, I haven't looked at their algorithm so much, right? Um, I'm not endorsing them, but another one to potentially look at is Truebill. Um, what they've built is they've built an app that basically looks at like all your subscriptions. Like what's all the stuff you forgot you signed up that you're paying for um, and kind of helps you manage and kind of cut ties with some of those. So that's another one that, I mean, that, that ends up when I look at my, uh, when I look at kind of my, my credit card statement, it's like, you know, Netflix, <laughs> Hulu. Hulu. I yeah. did I did share um Forbes actually just posted recently a um the best budgeting apps. I found it on Google. I just posted that link in there for anyone that yeah. wants to see. Um but yeah, like John and Craig were saying, the the banks also they do budget them for uh I mean categorize them for you. So it does make budgeting a lot easier. But subscriptions is definitely something to check on because I forgot about a lot of my subscriptions. So thank you, Craig, for bringing that up. <laughs> well, yeah. one, one thing that's changing right now, which is rapidly changing and I'm watching, and it's a big budget, is my uh, cable. So mm -hmm. internet access and how people consume TV and all of that is rapidly changing and the economics around it. I mean, you, you speak to somebody that's uh, middle-aged and you're spending – two, $200, $300 a month in content. And now, now that things are getting unbundled and you can, you know, depending on what you watch and what you care about in sports and how you buy your internet access, that's a rapidly changing um, business where I think it benefits the consumer. If again, if you're smart, you know, and depending on where you live and what's available, but that's like yeah. you know, your cell phone bill and like that kind of stuff. If you move in with a bunch of people and they're like, oh, we're going to get cable and we're going to split it. You know, somebody needs to say, what's the best way to really figure out that keep that bill? Because there's a ton of ways you can um, you can keep that one down that didn't exist five years ago. And five years from now, it'll be very different again. So yeah. that is very true. Um, thank you again, John and Craig, for being our hosts here. And thank you all for attending. If there's no other questions at the current moment. Um, I think we'll close our meeting for today, but thank you all again for attending. And if you haven't checked out TCNJ link where you can contact any alumni that are on there, just like Craig and John um, with any questions, you can see on there um, what their major was, what their jobs are, anything like that. It's just a good way, another good resource to keep in mind for as you're graduating. We do have all of these great alumni that are willing to just help in any way they can. Um, so thank you again, John and Craig, for helping us out here today and teaching us all about all the real world things that no one wants to have to do. <laughs> congratulations, to everybody. Best of luck to you. And uh, congratulations. Uh, graduation is probably, what, three or four weeks away, right? About that, yeah, I think it's just over a little, a little over a month away. Um, so that's good. It's exciting. <laughs> all right, wishing you all the best. Yeah, same here. Thank you all. Bye bye.